Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to look at Paul Pope's solo issue today, specifically his OMAC story, Ed. But first, let's look at Red Room. It's going to be coming out in May. There's the cover to issue one. You're going to see that on the stands in the very near future. We're going to be hitting the print button in about 10 days, Jimmy. Very, That's very exciting. excited. Very excited. Long, long time coming. Uh, horror... Uh, horror comic, monthly comic, murder on the dark web for fun and profit. So bring in modern day technology into a horror space. It's a horror comic that couldn't have existed even 10 years ago. You know, the, the, the situation was not possible. It was not in place. These are some of the variant covers, uh, retail incentive uh, variant covers. You did a great one. The Dan Klaus 8-Ball homage, Peach Momoko did one. She's exclusive to Marvel these days, man, so that might be one of the few uh, variants that she could do outside of that uh, sphere. And uh, this is the Third Eye Comics exclusive uh, variant cover that uh, stores can get when they uh, invest in Red Room at the thousand copy level, man. Many stores have done so already, so they're... Uh, Goosing the numbers big time, man. Can't wait for uh, the readers to find those comics, Jimmy. You can find my work at patreon.com slash jimrug, where I have been uploading my out-of-print zines and mini-comics, such as this notebook collection of ballpoint pen drawings. Uh, I also post a lot of my original art. I'm doing a comparison of a couple of Street Angel comics that are based on the same story, but I drew more than once. So you can find all of that and more at patreon.com slash jimrug. But we're here today, Ed, to talk about Paul Pope's OMAC story in Solo. Solo, one of the uh, coolest comic books I think Marvel and DC have published ever. The idea is Mark Chiarello, an editor at DC Comics, would go to these different cartoonists and basically they would get an issue to do... They all did short stories. I don't know if that was the mandate or not, but it allowed them to play with some different DC characters, some of their original work, with, I guess, a budget. And uh, a pretty exciting series, I think, for 12 issues. A lot of interesting cartoonists. Um, just a very unusual comic in the history of Marvel and DC. As we as we continue on the, on the channel, Mark Chiarella's name comes up. And uh, this guy is becoming, like, one of the most interesting people in mainstream comics uh, to me. I was going through my back issue bins, um, preparing future episodes and stuff. And I come across, you know, my Wolverine run. See, Mark Chiarello illustrated covers uh, that were inked by, like, Mignola. Yeah. You know? Um, or maybe it was, like, P. Craig Russell or something. I, I forget who inked it. Anyhow, he drew the stuff. He colors stuff. He inks stuff. He edits. All interesting stuff, too, he's by the, the way. He's the author of the DC Comics Guide to Coloring. You know? I mean, he's definitely this guy with an incredible visual pedigree. Friend of Alex, Alex Toth. See, he speaks a bunch on the Toth documentary. Yeah, really cool. So you can see this is basically what the solo uh, opening spreads would be on all the issues with their table of contents and a little bit of background. In this case, the uh, the definition of Paul Pope <laughs> and the definition <laughs> of solo. Uh, some a little bit extra here of like sketch materials, but really this is, in some ways it's almost like um, an eight ball or something like a one man anthology where you just happen to have access to corporate characters, specifically DC characters. This first story is about a minotaur, which, you know, not exactly a, a DC-owned character, but rather mythology. Um, probably speaking to Paul Pope's influences and, and interests. But the reason I wanted to look at this today is because we recently looked at Jack Kirby's OMAC number one. And this is Paul Pope basically redoing that first issue. Uh, I think it's a loving homage. Pope, we haven't, haven't covered Pope on the channel yet. But he burst onto the scene for me through um, Palmer's Picks and Wizard Magazine. Yeah. He was self-publishing at first, uh, his book THB, along with some graphic novels. THB is what I found. And it looked like nothing else. He was yes. using a brush at a time when Scott Williams' inking style was sort of the dominant, you know, super detailed pen work, sharp, precise pen. Pope showed up with this style of almost messy with a brush. And I think it influenced at least a generation. A lot of people followed him that really applied the same kind of approach aesthetically. Absolutely. But it was a breath of fresh air. And so, you know, I was a fan. It didn't look like anything else. It was exciting. It stood out. He would talk about different European and manga and fine art influences. And as he started to do work for DC Comics, at this point he had done um, Heavy Liquid for Vertigo. And he was gearing up for Batman 100, which uh, one of his big 
kind of big hits. But he was be being published now by Marvel and DC, and he starts talking about Kirby's influence, which always surprised me because I didn't... It, it, you know, his style looked so different than that. Uh, as he progressed, you would see more of that kind of Kirby figure and action coming through. But it was it was kind of a revelation to me when you, you get a guy that looks alternative and different, and of course there's some Kirby DNA in there. So that was always kind of cool and gave me a different insight into Kirby. And I thought that's what we would get uh, flipping through this story now. First thing that stands out to me is, here's page one of the OMAX story. Here's page one of Kirby's OMAX. So you can see it's the same story. Like he's, he's gonna hem very close to this, this original Kirby issue. And he even says so, loving tribute to, to Kirby. So kind of cool to see that part. But the other piece is the color. Day glow. It, Dave Stewart on colors on this, I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the magenta lettering on top of that, that bright green. And if you look, there's even green, you know, it's even referencing the original comic, but punched up. You know, this is the, a post-digital coloring moment. So diving right in, uh, the story's going to follow the same, same story arc as issue one of OMAC. Sometimes even lifting panels. I think this is a panel that appears in that original issue. There's some verbatim gimmick. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but you just get to see all of the coolest parts of the OMAC story, I think, are in here. Like these global peace agents look really, really wild with their faces masked off. Like, would you even think of applying spatter on something like that, right? Like, that's that that's that extra set of grace notes that, that Pope brings to the table. Yeah. I mean, with that in mind... I would never think of rendering a, a like a face and a head and a neck that way either. You know, there, you can see dry brush strokes in there. It's a lot of unusual mark making that adds up to an image that I like looking at. But it's it's definitely a different approach and one that you know I wasn't seeing too many people kind of approaching this style of drawing in comics. He draws very big too. Yeah, um, big paper because he's slinging like if your standard brush is the Winsor Newton two. His shit's like the Winsor Newton 7. Super thick, chunky brush. Yeah, and you can see lots of this kind of stuff. If you start diving into Paul Pope, you'll find these pictures of studio work and, and pages laid out, uh, you know, where you can see the scale. You can see kind of the freedom of the way he's inking and, and approaching these pages. You know, like any of the full bleed images you'll you'll see in the originals, just kind of the, the very raw brush strokes. Pretty cool, lots of energy. Uh, but you see him like punching up these concepts, you know, the brother eye satellite that really resembles an eyeball, even with veins and, and blood vessels. I like that stuff. It reminds me of whenever McFarlane would get hold of a character and it would almost be like reimagine the, the lizard. Yeah. You know, um, you get a little bit of that here. And it's that's what I it's I like seeing different artists and especially stylists interpret a character that I like. I, I like that. No holding lines. Uh, Iris. Yeah, it's a very good choice. Wonder, uh, you know, that's something he must talk to the colorist, you know, to work out. Or maybe has has a, you know, draw a red line or something on the original art to indicate where that should be. Buddy, buddy uh, Blank falling in love with one of these models. Again, following very closely to the OMAC uh, number one story. And if you're unfamiliar with that, I would encourage you to check out our video on that because you can really see that comparison then as you go go through this version. I hit him up not too long ago. Like the, the one Lila image uh, reminded me. You know he did he did like some some capsule um, design work for for uh, Donna Karen DKNY and I was watching some old Howard Stearns and he's got a Paul Pope DKNY shirt so I screen capped it sent it off to Paul I was like dude you ever see this he's like send that to me okay. yeah that's cool yeah fashion another one of the things that he would often talk about being influential and being interested in another thing that makes would make his art stand out. Did I see the year on this? I think this is... 2005. Okay. Yeah, it's important to, to note when he's doing some of the stuff he's doing because, again, so many people, I think, were influenced and, and borrowed pieces from him. Yeah. So this is later. Like, yeah. Because it, it would be... Like, like honestly, even uh, some like some of your earliest Street Angel, I feel like I saw a chunky brush in there that, that had Pope Pope energy to it. Absolutely. You know, he was doing stuff. The brush was what I mostly inked with. And I felt like he was playing the brush almost like maybe a musician, you know, like Jimi Hendrix on a guitar or something like just really approaching it in a way that I didn't see too many people doing that kind of stuff with a brush. Um, I think you can find some European artists that would mm -hmm. be using tools that way. 
but Pope was the guy that I saw doing it. And so that, that was kind of the, the example for me of like, yeah, that brush is more versatile than you realize, like push that thing. I think the action sequence are really well done throughout this. You see him doing almost like Kirby figures where he's really distorting Omac and bending him around in these ways that I see people criticize Kirby anatomy. And uh, I tend to think his anatomy is pretty solid because if you look, I saw baseball game footage from like a forties, you know, like black and white, they looked exactly like a Kirby drawing. Mm -hmm. The, the way that I guess their uniforms are baggier and bend, you know, and just seeing like figure in motion, it made total sense to me. But whenever you see people like, Let's let's incorporate that part. I'm doing a Kirby homage here. Let's really bend these figures around. Gotcha. It's great. You have to do it. Yeah, I love seeing it. It's almost a creative freedom to bend bend your anatomy rules a little bit. She looks great. The build a friend model looks really cool. I think in in Pope's rendering. I wonder if packing peanuts existed in Kirby's day. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It <laughs> might be a new invention. Could be. I think he does a good job of keeping that tone, that that weird like relationship tone where you feel bad for the model somehow, for this robotic bits and pieces of this robot assassin. And maybe you feel a little bad for Buddy Blank, you know, giving up his, his friend. But same deal, same story. He's going to have to destroy that. And you see him walking away from the aftermath in a very violent explosion. Uh, capturing some of that emotional disconnect. We didn't we didn't mention it, but it was mentioned in the comments, and it crossed my mind when we were going through the issue. But people were like, "Did Kirby invent the badass walking away from the explosion?" <laughs> and I can't think of an earlier example. That's that's really strong. If that's something that he added to pop culture, way to go! Yeah. While we have this issue, you know, I'd like to do more solo issues, Definitely. and and it's it's Some kind months. of figuring out like how to manage some of these series and things. But while we have Pope's solo issue. Um, I thought we'd look at a couple of these stories. Life Size Monster Ghost. Yeah, this is uh, a comic basically about the ads that were in the comics. So go get your copy of Mail Order Mysteries, and you could read about the disappointment of all those things <laughs> yes. that you were getting. The Life Size Monster Ghost. Like you would see that, that would be a bigger ad, maybe, you know, the size of two mm -hmm. ads on, on those pages. And what it is is like uh, this little piece of canvas, and then you're, you're supposed to blow up a balloon and, and uh, encase it over that. So that's what this is, man. It's this little kid. Maybe it's a young Paul Pope, man, is uh, ordering weird gimmicks from uh, from the comic books. And yeah, I do wonder if it is uh, an ad that is in, because uh, that would be have meta value to it. And he's certainly disappointed by the stuff. Gets the uh, X-ray specs. Of course, they don't work either. <laughs> There's some weird uh, scam to it. And at the end, he's basically lamenting that he did not, uh, he wished he got the uh, sea monkeys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> did you have sea monkeys as a kid? I did not. I, I rarely ordered anything, so I, I didn't have too much. You know, I, I had sea monkeys, but I think you get them from the science store at the mall or something. And it would just be like a packet of brine sh shrimp or like something real manageable. I had two sets. Could never teach them to run through hula hoops, though. <laughs> of course not. The, uh, the other story that I think is noteworthy is Teenage Sidekick. This is a story about Robin, uh, obviously Batman's sidekick. Batman created by Bob Kane. Boy, does that take on different meaning after watching that documentary. But the noteworthy part here is James Jean doing color. You know, they're, they're different collaborators with each of these stories. And uh, James Jean, at the time, maybe still doing Fables covers, but certainly a very accomplished illustrator and now a, a fine artist and a painter. So you get to see his approach to color and you can see almost the painting quality uh, in, in that regard. You know, even the palette, pretty unusual with the, with the pinks everywhere. Yeah, I see, I see some shadow uh, behind the um, line art. So I think that it must be a, like a blue line application at, at, a, at a late stage. You yeah, know? That's, that is surprising. You're right. You can really see it with like this fence piece here. Uh, you can really see some of the yeah, shadows. Behind behind Robin's hair, behind his cowlick, you can see it real easy. That's interesting to think because, I mean, everything's digital at this point. You can see digital lettering on this stuff. Most of this coloring is going to be digital. That OMAC story colored by Dave Stewart, I'm sure, was all digital. Um, but, yeah, apparently maybe not for this story, which would make it stand out. And you see, again, very interesting color choices as we get into, like, the Joker's lair not an awful story either. Uh, basically, the, the conceit is that uh, 
Batman would be the same as the Joker if it wasn't for having Robin mm-hmm. to kind of like keep him tethered to humanity. Great I, colors with this like light blue and the, the magenta. The, oh, by the way, that's same influence like from from the people who kind of crib uh, Paul Pope style. They crib this palette of this this uh, poppy blue and that magenta. I can think of maybe four examples off the top of my head right now. I love the the hand lettering that is in here. The sound effect lettering looks so good. And this is a great device. This is like an industrial shredder. You throw a refrigerator or a car or something in here. That's a pretty good death trap to throw uh, your your kid's sidekick into. Absolutely, man. When YouTube videos started coming out, man, there are like whole channels devoted to people throwing cool shit into those things, yes. man. <laughs> How about that for uh, a, a good tie-in with our show? The marching orders. Yeah. So kind of, kind of a novelty to see uh, James Jean there on color. I, I don't know... How many other comics he's colored? Certainly, I don't think any that he didn't draw. And then uh, a little bit of a write-up about Paul Pope. One of the interesting pieces in this biography is that uh, he was Kodansha, the giant manga publisher in Tokyo, had a few of these non-Japanese artists coming in to work on something they called World Manga Project. Uh, Mobius, Baru, uh, Dave Mazzucchelli, and Paul Pope are the people that are named here. I would love to see this thing. Me too. Supposedly, Pope produced hundreds of comics pages, only about a dozen pages have ever seen print. I think he self-published those. Smoke Navigator is, is I believe, that project. Um, But an interesting artist in an interesting series, and uh, I expect us to look at more solo issues as well as more Paul Pope issues. But that OMAC homage pretty unusual it's not something that's in you know other solo issues it's not like that was part of the vision for the series but it's kind of cool to see that reimagining of you know one of my favorite kirby comics by a cartoonist i was super into at this time so it all it all worked really well for me and kind of need to look that up not the last solo issue not the last paul pope comic i suspect ben uh ready to bounce k favors like follow subscribe to the youtube channel uh hit the bell icon we'll notify you when new vids are available jimmy what's out there follow me on patreon.com slash jim rug where you can download my out of print hard to find zines and mini comics you can see lots of my original art and process and you can see me writing little essays and comparing some of my uh comics and and how i make comics patreon.com slash jim rug order your red room comics they're going to start coming out in may and they're going to start coming out on a monthly basis you could uh pre-order the, the comics or or order them at my link tree in the description below you can read the issues ahead of time by way of my uh patreon in the link tree in the description below this video be sure to subscribe to the cartoonist kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video to keep up with everything we have going on you can also find cartoonist kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video jimmy give them one last set of marching orders man we're going to be on our way read more comics